Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In this video, we're going to talk about constituency. The constituency represents the internal structure that we discussed in the last video. Constituents are those internal structures. Constituents can be anything from a word up to a clause, up to a whole sentence containing multiple clauses. All of those things are constituents. A constituent is an internal unit of syntactic structure. So for example, from the, exa from the uh, example we used in the last video, the TA who is here can eat chocolate. The TA who is here is an internal unit of structure. It's something that can be referenced by other rules in the system. We have two notations for representing constituency. One is to use brackets, like you see here in this structure. If you have a, a pair of square brackets around a structure, then we uh, identify it as a constituent. The other representation is tree notation, which we will do in a later video. So, what do constituents really represent? One thing that's important to understand is that they typically represent semantically connected material. Often an item plus all of its modifiers form a constituent. So for example, let's take the sentence, the elephant snorted a bowl of peanuts. If we think carefully about this sentence, there's a, there's a, a key intuition that the the is associated with elephant, not with peanuts, right? And peanuts and snorted are more closely related than the and snorted, right? So there, there are some kinds of groupings of things that are semantically connected. We're going to capture this with our representations of constituency. So semantically connected material are going to be grouped together into constituents. Now, we have a number of tests we can use to identify whether something is a constituent or not. The first of these tests is the modification test, which draws upon that insight we just talked about, that semantically related material um, sits together as a constituent. Now, the, the modification test says that if one word that mean, uh, modifies, meaning limits the meaning of another, then they're probably part of the same constituent. So take, for example, I bought a red balloon. Ah and red, they both modify balloon. They tell you what kind of balloon you have, and they tell you that there was one of them. So they're all part of the same constituent, a red balloon. So one test you can use to identify whether or something uh, is a constituent is to sort of check those modification relationships. If, if one item modifies another, then they're part of the same constituent. Another um, test draws upon the idea that we're looking at internal units of syntactic structure. So if you find items that behave as units with respect to some kind of syntactic process, then we know they're constituents. One kind of syntactic process we have is movement. You can move things around in a sentence under certain circumstances. If you can move something, then you know it's a constituent. So if you can move a group of words, that's a constituent. So uh, let's take an example here. It is, or it was, blank that. So if you stick something in that position, you know you have a constituent. So it was a brand new car that he bought. That a brand new car is a constituent because it can appear in that slot. Another example is preposing. This, this is actually technically a, res, a reverse pseudoclef, but we'll just call it preposing, where you can take some item and move it to the front of the sentence. So big bowls of beans are what I like. It's moving something into this initial position from where it started, I like big bowls of beans, uh, shows that big bowls of beans is a constituent. 
Another example is the passive. So for example, if something can sit in the subject position of the passive, it's a constituent. So the slobbering dog kissed the big boy. That's the active form of the sentence. The slobbering dog kissed the big boy. You can move the big boy to the front of the sentence by making it a passive. The big boy was kissed by the slobbering dog. That tells us that the big boy is a constituent. There are many, many, many different kinds of movement. I don't, uh, we're going to explore those as we move through the semester. But uh, this gives you an idea how we can use movement as a test to see whether something is a constituent or not. Another standard constituency test, again, makes reference to the idea that if you have a syntactic process and it identifies a group of words, those groups must be um, uh, constituents. So another process we have is where we replace one form with another. So if you can replace a group of words with a single word, roughly keeping the meaning the same, then they're likely to be a constituent. So I've always lo loved the man in a natty suit. So the man in the natty suit is what we're going to test to see if it's a constituent. And we can replace it with a single word, like a name. So I will always love John. John here standing in for the man in the natty suit. That tells us that uh, the man in the natty suit is a constituent because it can be replaced by a single word. Um, there's a particular version of that test where you try to replace a, um, a constituent with a, what we call a proform, so a kind of pronominal replacement. So um, we have more than pronouns. You've probably heard of pronouns. We also have proverbs, not proverbs, pro-adjectives. And again, if we can replace the group of words with one of those items, then we know they, have a, they form a constituent. So the, the classic case of using a pronoun is, I've always loved the man in an Addy suit. I've always loved him. Him is a pronoun replacing the man in an Addy suit. That tells us that that's a constituent. We have other proforms as well. So for example, um, what I've bracketed in the next sentence, Susan bought a truck with mag wheels. Bought a truck with mag wheels is, um, is a verb phrase. And we can replace uh, this string with what's called a proverb. The, the most common proverb in English is did so or did to. Um, so, Susan bought a truck with mag wheels, Bill did too. Did too stands in for bought a truck with mag wheels. So that's a pro-verb standing in for that verb phrase. We also have similar kinds of constructions for adjectives, and that's usually so. Okay, our third test that we can use is to look, I'm sorry, it's our fourth test, our fourth test that we can use is ellipsis. Ellipsis means to leave something off. So just like you can move an item or you can replace an item, if you can leave off a string of words, then we know that uh, you have a constituent. So an ellipsis is that deletion of a string. In English, the most easy kind of ellipsis we have are verb phrase ellipses. There's other kinds of ellipses, but verb phrase ellipses are the most common ones. So here's what happens is if you have a verb phrase, then it can be deleted under identity with another verb phrase. So let's take um, this sentence. Bill found a gold nugget in the stream, but I don't think John will. Well, what, what will John do? John will find a gold nugget in the stream. We're missing a chunk in that second clause. After the auxiliary will, we're missing find a gold nugget in the stream. So Bill found a, nugget, a gold nugget in the stream, but I don't think John will find a gold nugget in the stream. That tells us that find a gold nugget in a stream is in fact a, a constituent. In this case, a verb phrase constituent. One more. Well, two more, but this is the last one that's really secure. Um, Another test you can use is whether or not the string of words you're looking at can stand alone as a sentence fragment. 
The easiest way to do this is to ask a question and then see if you can use that string of words as an answer to the question. So, what did Heidi buy at the flea market? A bag of moldy vacuum cleaner parts. That string, which is a sentence fragment, is a legitimate uh, response to the question, what did Heidi buy at the flea market? That string is a constituent. What did Heidi do at the flea market? Buy some cheap t-shirts. That's another verb phrase constituent. Buy plus a direct object. That is um, a constituent. Where did Heidi put them? In the back of her car. That's a prepositional phrase constituent, where we have a preposition followed by a noun phrase. Each of those strings in the answers, because they're grammatical, are constituents, because they can stand alone in answer to a question. We have one more test that is not quite as reliable, which is if you can conjoin two things together, um, or coordinate is another term, um, then you, um, those two items are probably constituents of the same type. So, for example, John and the man went to the store. John is a noun phrase and the man is a noun phrase. Those are both constituents. They're conjoined with and. And you can see that if you try and conjoin John with something else, like quickly the man, that's not a constituent. That's just terrible. Um, there are some problems with this test, um, so here's my linguistics general warning. Um, there are lots of situations where the conjunction test will actually give you false results. So use it sparingly and use it with caution, or maybe don't use it at all and use the other tests. That's The other thing that this raises is I would strongly encourage you to use multiple tests. If you're trying to figure out if something is a constituent, try two or three tests. Don't just try one, because sometimes they give you false positives, and uh, they can lead you astray. But if you, have mul if you apply multiple tests, then you're going to do pretty well in identifying what's a constituent and what isn't. Let's do some examples. So we're going to look at the sentence, John eats at really fancy restaurants. Eats at really fancy restaurants is a verb phrase and is a constituent. But let's test that to make sure that that's really true. Let's make sure that the string in parentheses is in fact a constituent. So first of all, can it stand in response to a question? What does John do in his spare time? Eat at really fancy restaurants. By the way, I'm going to play a little fast and loose with the inflectional suffixes here, but um, the, this, the basic string is the same. Um, can you replace it with a pro form? So with a pronoun or a proverb, because this is a verb phrase, we would try to use a, um, a proverb. John eats at really fancy restaurants and Bill does too. Does too stands as the pro form that represents eats at really fancy restaurants. So we've done a replacement test here. That tells us it is, in fact, a verb phrase. Can you move it? Here I've got to change the inflection a little bit. So um, I've got eating at really fancy restaurants. That's John's favorite pastime. So I've taken that verb phrase string and I've moved it to the front of the sentence. I had to change the morphology a little bit, but you'll see that I can, in fact, move that exact same um, uh, stretch of words up to the front of the sentence. That tells us that it is also a constituent. Um, here's another example. This is a different kind of movement. Um, this is VP fronting, verb phrase fronting. I told John to eat at really fancy restaurants, and eat at really fancy restaurants he will. That kind of construction also shows that this is a verb phrase that has, um, this string of words is acting as a verb phrase and a constituent. To see how um, these tests work, it also helps to look at a case where we don't have a constituent. So let's take John eats at really fancy restaurants, but let's the test the string eats at really. This is not a constituent. Right off the bat, you should see this is the case because remember our modification rule tells us that modifiers have to be parts of the same constituent. 
and really here is modifying fancy, right? So um, by blocking really off from fancy, we've we it can no longer be a modifier of fancy. So that in and of itself should tell us that this is not a constituent. But let's run through some of the other tests. So can it stand alone in answer to a question? What does John do in his spare time? Eat it really. Mwah. Terrible. Replace by a pro form. So because this is a verb, for, uh, this is a verb item, we would try to do, do do to. John eats at really fancy restaurants, and Bill does so to fancy restaurants. So there, what I'm doing is I'm just replacing that string in parentheses, and it's terrible. And can it uh, move around? Absolutely not. Eating at really is what John does fancy restaurants. Or it's eating at really fancy restaurants. John does, it's eating at really, that John does fancy restaurants. It's almost impossible to say. So that shows us that this particular string of words is not a constituent. So these tests do seem to do the right thing. They test, um, they show when a group of words is a constituent, and they show when a group of words is not a constituent. So let's just summarize our, um, our discussion in this video. Constituents are groups of words that function syntactically as a unit. Um, they, catch a, they capture judgments about the relatedness of words and about the hierarchical structures of sentences. Um, we, I gave you a whole string of tests um, with varying reliability. There's modification. Can you move the string? Can you replace the string? Can you delete the, the string? Can the string stand alone in answer to a question? Or can you conjoin or coordinate the string? Um, if any of those things are true, then it's probably the case you have a constituent. All right, with this object of study identified, we now have to explain how we get them. So that's a matter of proposing a hypothesis about how constituents are structured. That will be the uh, topic of the next video where we consider phrase structure rules. Phrase structure rules are our first hypothesis about capturing constituency.